Our next speaker, last uh, formal speaker of the session, gets extra points for effort as he's just off a plane from Berlin, literally. <coughs> I'm a member of the United Frequent Stranded <laughs> Program. <laughs> right. So this is William Jagas from the University of California at Berkeley, who uh, will talk on age-related pathology, cognition, and resilience. Bill. I guess I, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, actually, uh, I think uh, the introduction from uh, Susan's talk was very similar to the way I wanted to introduce mine, so I don't have an introduction. Um, you all know what uh, I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, beta amyloid and, uh, and uh, tau, two pathologies that uh, occur in the brain as we age. They're obviously intimately linked with Alzheimer's disease, but they're also strongly linked to aging. And um, these are the, uh, uh, the sort of the schema that the Brox uh, proposed uh, well over uh, two decades ago. And I just want to point out that, the, um, uh, th that these are not randomly distributed throughout the brain, particularly when we talk about the neurofibrillary tangle pathology, because that's become very integral to our understanding of differences between aging and Alzheimer's disease. And in particular, I guess I would point out that the, um, uh, the tangles are, are, are really ubiquitous in the medial temporal lobe. These are, again, Brock data, uh, showing in purple the percentage of individuals who, uh, who have neurofibrillary tangles in their brain. It reaches basically 100% uh, by the uh, uh, ninth and 10th decades of life. And this is um, very strong driven by tangle pathology in the entorhinal cortex uh, and uh, associated uh, medial temporal regions of the brain. Uh, 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 beta amyloid pathology is also quite ubiquitous, but not uh, nearly as much as the tau pathology. So I'm going to think this is the basis for what I'm going to talk about. So you know we can measure uh, amyloid pathology with amyloid imaging. I, I, I'm not going to belabor this, uh, except to point out that this amyloid positive uh, individual from my lab in this study um, has as much amyloid in the brain as that Alzheimer's disease patient does. You can't differentiate them necessarily uh, by the amount of amyloid in the brain. And uh, similarly, the cognitive function uh, of the uh, amyloid positive uh, control is no different than the cognitive function of the amyloid negative control. So uh, as I think it was Adam that pointed out, this either raises questions about resilience or perhaps questions that amyloid isn't doing what we think it is, although I don't quite uh, believe that's the case. So this just shows you aggregate data now from quite a lot of uh, Alzheimer patients and controls, many of those controls in purple are up there with the Alzheimer's patients in terms of the amount of amyloid in the brain. There are some Alzheimer's cases who don't have amyloid in the brain, and I, again, I can tell you that most of those cases, at least the ones who've come to autopsy, don't actually have Alzheimer's disease. So I, I, think, I think that, that um, explains that. Uh, and uh, again, as Susan said, about 30% of cognitively normal people in their 70s have substantial amyloid accumulation by PET. So this is a ubiquitous issue, and we'll talk about how this is related to cognition. The uh, more um, recently, we've been able to look at uh, uh, tau in the brain, and I, I think you all know that this began about, about four years ago with this compound that we're using. Many other labs uh, are using it called AV1451. And um, in this particular image, you can see the progression of tau pathology from young people who are in their 20s uh, who have virtually no uh, tau pathology uh, through older adults who are in their uh, mid to late 70s and then older adults who are PIB positive where you begin to see amyloid uh, deposits in the lateral and inferior temporal uh, neocortex and of course Alzheimer's patients have substantial uh, tau pathology everywhere. Uh, the PIB negative older adults actually have tau in the, in the medial temporal lobes but it doesn't show up so clearly here. Um, this is sort of a stereotypical pattern of tau. It, 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 it deposits in very, very characteristic parts of the brain. This is across everyone now, including people who are cognitively impaired. Uh, and you see, again, it's a very interesting pattern. It's just not random. It's, it particularly affects the temporal lobes. And um, uh, maybe spend just a second on this to point out that we can actually uh, come up with a sort of a pseudo Brock staging approach that, that aggregates these brain regions of interest in which we can actually classify an individual into falling into a, a Brock stage, but I, I don't want to spend much time on that. So how about all of this in cognition? Well, uh, this was a meta-analysis done a few years ago by uh, Trey Hedden and, and Huami O oh, uh, that looked at about uh, 3,500 individuals cross-sectional data and compared amyloid positive to amyloid negative. And you can see that on average, individuals with amyloid in the brain were performing more poorly on a, a wide range of cognitive tests, but particularly episodic memory. But I, what I really want to point 
out to you is that this effect is very small. So the, the R squared is, is vanishingly small in terms of the amount of cognitive function that beta amyloid explains in a cross-sectional group of subjects. But when you look longitudinally, I think the story is quite different. And I think if you look across multiple cohorts, uh, you do see that amyloid uh, predicts uh, cognitive decline. And in, in our data, we actually looked at the rate of amyloid deposition, which you see there on the x-axis, and the change in, in, in the CVLT long-delayed free recall uh, on the y-axis. And you, you can see that over about four years, the more amyloid an individual was depositing, uh, the faster they declined on their memory, on their memory test. So uh, I don't think this is uh, I don't think this is a innocent uh, an innocent uh, thing to happen. Um, and uh, again, I, I agree with things that people have said previously that the more pathology you have in your brain, the faster this de uh, the decline is. And it may certainly be that amyloid doesn't act alone. Um, uh, similarly, uh, the Tau story is beginning to show even stronger relationships with uh, cognition. These are data uh, from a while ago when we had a small sample, but I can tell you these results are holding up, which is basically that what you're seeing here is a correlation uh, between a cross-sectional performance on an on a episodic memory composite score and then a longitudinal uh, a, 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 a correlation with longitudinal change in this cognitive test preceding the time of the tau PET scan. And these blue voxels are the blue voxels where more tau was associated with either worse memory cross-sectionally or faster decline. So, um, so this is, again, whether this is, uh, I, I don't want to belabor the question of what's Alzheimer's disease and what's normal aging, but this is a, a pathology that's associated with both that is associated with cognitive decline. So um, in thinking about, about this talk, I, I, I wanted to put it in some kind of context. And I, I can't do this because we don't have enough uh, data on tau. So I'm, I'm just going to talk about beta amyloid and cognition and look at the, just tell you about three studies um, in, in, in relationship to this. And one is, uh, if we start with people who have amyloid in the brain and are cognitively normal, we can talk about this idea of compensation or reserve to ask whether there's neural adaptation that might explain cognition or whether there's brain differences in people who maintain cognition in the face of amyloid accumulation. But conversely, we can also look at people who are cognitively normal and doing very, very well and ask what the importance of beta amyloid might or might not be uh, in, in people who live in, into advanced age with youth, youthful cognition. So I'm just going to tell you about three studies. Uh, one's been published. Uh, two are, uh, are, are still ongoing. Um, the one that's been published was the study by uh, Jeremy Elman and Huami O. Oh. We've, we've been impressed with increased brain activity in people who are amyloid positive, similar to some of the data that Yaakov showed in the first session. And so what we did is we had them perform a, uh, a, a memory encoding task where they looked at images while they were in the uh, fMRI scanner, and they had to do some uh, irrelevant task, whether there's people or no people in the image. Uh, when they got out of the scanner, <clears throat> we asked them, questions uh, which were in writing because we didn't want to show them the image. So we first asked them a question about uh, a gist. Did you see a boy on a skateboard? And if they responded yes, we asked them an, a number of questions about that particular image. Was the boy wearing a blue shirt? Was he doing a headstand, et cetera? And on average, there were six details to every picture. And the punchline of this uh, is, is actually relatively straightforward. These are areas in the brain where individuals who are amyloid positive activated more than individuals who didn't have amyloid in the brain. And we took these images and masked uh, the fMRI uh, scans. And what you can see is the actual activation was correlated with the number of details of the images that the subjects uh, recalled. So I think this is some evidence that this increased brain activation could be playing a, con a compensatory function, although, as some people have pointed out, we don't know at what point in their lifespan their brain sort of developed this particular way of, of performing. I'd also point out that we don't see this in the hippocampus, and that's a, another story. I think perhaps what's going on in the hippocampus is a, different, is a different story, and actually some of our data points in a very different direction. In any case, these, um, these increased activations do appear to have some benefit. So this is a project that's underway. I, I guess the next two I I have some trepidation because we're not really done, but I, I wanted to share it with you. 
And uh, this was done by uh, Eder uh, Aranaza Urquillo, who was um, a postdoc with Gail Shadalot, who spent some time in our lab. And she wanted to find people who are highly at risk for dementia, sort of a little bit what, what, what we've been talking about previously. So she took individuals uh, who, who were basically over age 70 who had high risk. And so in our cohort, we had 177 individuals who had amyloid glucose metabolism and APOE. She took the 150 that were over 70 at their baseline. And then she took individuals who were uh, E4 carriers uh, and, or had a positive family history uh, and were PIB positive. And so at the end, we had 23 sub such subjects. So uh, essentially, they were all amyloid positive and they either had an, uh, an E4 or a family history of Alzheimer's disease. So these were people who we would presume would be at pretty high risk of having Alzheimer's disease, but they were cognitively normal. Uh, and we had a low risk group uh, that was matched for age, sex, and education. They didn't have E4 or a family history, they were amyloid negative. Uh, so when we looked at their gray matter volume, what you see is the individuals in the high risk or the resilient group had larger brain volumes in these particular regions that are outlined uh, in, uh, in, that are masked with red here. And I think what you can see is that these are particularly, um, let's just see, which one is the, um, I think you can particularly see, th these are diffuse, but they're particularly in the medial temporal uh, brain regions, to some extent in the medial prefrontal and the uh, medial parietal lobes. Uh, and then when we looked at glucose metabolism, it wasn't quite as clear, uh, some in the prefrontal cortex. So these are brain regions that were uh, larger or more, more metabolic in those individuals who were high risk than the individuals who were low risk. Um, and when you look at this as a map of the proportion of, of cases that actually um, showed a super threshold voxels, again, one standard deviation over the mean, uh, again, you can see this pattern quite clearly for the gray matter increases. It's really in the medial prefrontal and medial parietal cortex and the hippocampus, or the medial, uh, I'm sorry, the medial temporal lobe where these, uh, these kinds of things pop out. Um, just to show you that we did, we did select a, a cognitively uh, impressive group of people. This is their performance on a, a, a cognitive uh, clusters, uh, basically clusters of memory, uh, working memory, speed of processing, um, and, uh, and inhibition. They're actually matched on every uh, task except for memory. So the, the high-risk group is actually doing better uh, on the episodic memory score uh, than the low-risk group is. But when we follow them over time, actually, we see an interaction. Uh, now I don't get stunned by the, by the size of this slope. It's, it's all a function of the scale and, a, and, a, and a, the estimated marginal means. But what you do see is that over time, the high-risk group is actually declining faster than the low-risk group. So this gives, gives you the idea that these people, yes, they are protected. Maybe it's these brain uh, changes and, uh, or these brain differences in volume and metabolism that are protecting them uh, uh, to some extent. Um, but at any rate, they seem to be, uh, uh, they seem to be nevertheless at great risk and probably declining over time. Uh, finally, this is a study that uh, is just getting started uh, by Tessa Harrison, who's a postdoc who joined my lab recently. And she's looking at this from the other perspective, that is not looking at people with amyloid, but looking at people who seem to be doing very well. And she started again with these same 150 cases of people who were 70 and older uh, and took individuals who scored uh, over 14 on the long delay free recall of the CVLT, which is our normal for 20 year olds, is a pretty good score. Uh, and we've called these people successful agers. Um, and then we took typical older adults uh, who scored in the range of 9 to 13 and sort of a, a, a mean, uh, sort of a, a, around the mean for the group. Um, and these, and these groups were not actually that well matched. So there's something to keep in mind. The uh, successful agers, while not statistically different on education, were, were, were definitely more educated. Uh, and they also tended to be more female. Uh, and so uh, you have to keep that in mind. But uh, this is my last slide. And this is a work in progress, but I just wanted to show you this, this first uh, look at the data. And what we're looking at here on the x-axis is age, and on the y-axis is the total amount of amyloid in the brain. And what you can see is there is an increase uh, in amyloid with age in the, in the typical onset group to some extent. But there's really a, a negative relationship in these successful agers. And actually, if you look for, it may be hard to see in the back of the
the room, uh, but if you, I, I can barely see it up here, but, uh, but if, you look at, if you look for the um, amyloid, uh, the, the, the typical, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the successful agers in purple, uh, there aren't many of these uh, purple dots to the right, so over here. Uh, I mean, here's one, for example, and that's a low amyloid level. There, on the other hand, all the, all the high amyloid levels are in the typical onset agers. Once, individual, once this group gets to be over about 80, uh, you don't see any individuals with these high amyloid levels. So again, probably a little too early to talk about this, but uh, I think this is, uh, or, this is, or it's not, not too early to talk about it, or maybe too early to draw conclusions, but I think this is an interesting um, uh, observation. So um, the, way, uh, the way I think about this is that amyloid and tau are likely substrates of age-related cognitive decline. I, we can, I'm certainly willing to get into a discussion of what's normal aging and what's disease. It's, a, it's always a fun discussion. It's best after you've had something to drink. But, but um, uh, I, I think whether it's normal aging or something else, they're common pathologies, and their distribution is important. But in the presence of, uh, of beta amyloid, it seems there's evidence that both some kinds of compensation and also maybe pre-existing neural reserve can confer some sort of resilience or resistance to cognitive decline. Decline, uh, whereas the absence of A-beta in, in older people, especially much older people, uh, may be associated with preservation of optimal or youthful cognition. So um, that's really all I have to say, and uh, especially Ader and Tessa, Jeremy and Hwami did uh, uh, most of the work that I showed you today. Thank you. Hey, Bill. Um, so the, the second study that you presented with the high risk versus the low risk, is the low risk group also, is it, are they also amyloid positive but lacking the additional risk factors or are they an amyloid negative group? The low risk group was uh, amyloid negative, right. So, so I, I definitely see where you're, you're going in this. We'd actually like to have uh, a high, uh, an amyloid positive group that's showing symptoms, but we don't, we don't actually have a, comp a comparable group. I think it really helps the interpretation too, because you're saying that yeah. they're even higher than the amyloid negative group, you know, implying that, you know, perhaps, especially the increases in brain volume and glucose metabolism, I mean, that perhaps this is a lifelong thing that they have going into yeah. it. It's not yeah. that they, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I agree. So, Bill, you alluded to this before, but um, we tend to look where the light is, and the light over all these recent years has been on amyloid imaging. Do you have a sense of whether or not the cutoff that you use for amyloid imaging is related to elevated tau, now that you're doing tau imaging? Because, of course, that would change the interpretation of a good deal. So this is a super interesting question. And um, let me, without, without treading too far onto the thin ice, tell you that I don't think thresholds are really the way to think about these things. We have to do it because in many cases we need to classify individuals as amyloid positive or negative. But I've been impressed in data both from my own lab and data we've looked at in ADNI that suggests that if you're amyloid negative and your, amyl and your PIB or or beta peer or whatever scan is increasing over time, that that's a bad thing. And I think it may actually have to do with how fast your amyloid is increasing in terms of whether you're, <clears throat> whether you're depositing tau more than whether you have, or, or at least as much as whether you have reached a threshold. So let me put it this way. If you're over the threshold, uh, the ch it seems like you're going to have more, am more tau in the brain, more widely dispersed. But if you're under the threshold, I think tau can also start to be uh, be um, showing up in brain regions we don't think it should be in if your amyloid is increasing. Very nice presentation, Bill. Uh, I just wanted to point out a circular uh, logic in your last study. Age has a significant effect on uh, performance, cognitive performance, as well as sex has a significant impact. Females perform better than males generally speaking, on memory. So when you take a threshold and classify individuals as successful aging versus not, and the fact that all the changes in cogn cognition are not completely attributable to amyloid, it gives you the fact that older individuals will have less amyloid. Does, it, does that make sense? I'm not sure I understand. So age, uh, so th there are multiple pathologies 
that contribute to cognitive decline. And age is a very significant contributor. If you uh, follow individuals, cognition declines with age. And as you get, look at older ages, you, you have a, a contribution of vascular pathologies along with amyloid. So at older ages, the effect that you see in successful agers having less amyloid can be just attributed to that. Does it make sense? I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. I mean, my, I mean you're suggesting that there are a, a wide variety of other factors associated with successful aging that may not simply reflect, that may yeah, be driving. Our, yeah, well, maybe this is a longer discussion because I, I, don't, I can certainly understand why that might be related to cognitive outcomes, uh, but I don't really understand why it's necessarily related to amyloid outcomes.